Caravan Wilson, welcome back to the Damn Right Podcast. Good to have you. Thank you. Thanks for having me back again. And we are here today to talk about um, a recap of the Henry Stewart Creative Ops Conference, which the name is a bit deceptive because uh, it was more than just creative ops. It was actually four tracks, um, creative operations, photo studio operations, design operations, and creative production. Uh, we both went, this just happened this past week. It was Thursday, right? May 16th. Um, and uh, we both went and uh, it was, I'm not going to lie, it was hard to uh, pick which sessions to go to. We used different tactics there. I, uh, Although I had the all access passed, I, I, I wasted it because I spent my whole day in the creative operations uh, that was chaired by our friend Thomas Stilling. Uh, and you, you, you took a bit different of a tactic. You jumped around a bit more, right? I did. I, I divided my time between creative operations, creative production, and design operations. So I caught a couple of presentations from each one. And um, I, I did unfortunately miss the photo studio operations. So I don't think we have anything from that event. In order to frame this conversation, you've, you've given us a big head start here. You've just this morning kind of posted your five, it's kind of ver five variations on a theme, uh, five themes uh, on, on LinkedIn. People should definitely check that out. But I thought we might use that as a way to just walk through some of the takeaways and share our thoughts on, on the conference. Could you, would you mind sharing your first, your first takeaway? Yeah, the first thing that came to mind is sort of a framing uh, takeaway, which was uh, creatives are having to do more with less. There's more channels, there's evolving audience needs, um, there, there's more demand from, um, from stakeholders, but there's less budget, there's less resources. So there was definitely a theme about getting creative with those constraints and those demands and trying to figure out what to do about it. So I saw that coming up over and over and over again. Yeah. I, one specific thing I'll call out, John Pagano, JJ Pagano, he said people call him, uh, from Paramount Pictures talked about they have, in the creation of content, um, they have gone from taking upwards of 60 minutes to create two and a half minutes of content to taking eight to 10 minutes to create eight minutes of content. I thought that was just astounding. I mean, wild, right? That's bonkers. That's like a, a ridiculous increase in efficiency, largely yeah. attributed to um, use of both automation and and AI. Um, so that was interesting. But yeah, I think that speaks to, to what you're talking about there. And I just kind of threw out AI there. I mean, when you're in your interpretation of what you heard, was that really kind of the linchpin that that whole doing more with less was, or do you, were there other ways that that came up? No, it actually came up in a lot of other ways. So maybe we'll definitely come to AI because that's a huge 800 pound gorilla in the room, uh, in all the rooms. But um, no, I think where I started my day was with uh, uh, the folks from Nickelodeon talking about how they had to adapt during the pandemic. And this is the folks that run their YouTube channel and many, many channels, I, I should say tw 24 channels, I believe, uh, global, globally. Um, so they had to shift immediately from, we have no way to access our library. We have no way to shoot, uh, you know, talent in the studio. We've all got to retreat to our apartments. What do we do? So that was where it all began. Um, and so they started getting creative with um repurposing content into puppet form and things like that. So rather than, you know, having live actors like using puppets and and things like that. And, and they did talk about um, later innovations in the ability to search and find and repurpose um, content from their library and that being another way of doing more with less. So not, not needing to shoot new content, a new original uh, material. And that same theme came up again. I was, this was also in the same track on creative production. There was a panel of producers. Um, and I, I think the topic was doing more with less. And so that was just the whole theme. Um, and there were a lot of different things that came up, but one recurring theme there was also similarly um, making one piece of content that can be repurposed, 
many, many times and take many derivative forms. So that that was coming up. Uh, use of archival content again was coming up. Um, and, and I actually saw that in a third session in the design operations room, which was uh, um, a presentation from the uh, company uh, Seltra, which, which helps people kind of create using atomic content, as they say, yeah. uh, kind of very rapidly repurposed. Now, there's AI layered into all this a little bit, but the theme here was... Um, and, and even another group I was thinking of it was Hilton, and uh, they talked about something similar, kind of a master content model mm -hmm. with many derivative assets and kind of, um, you know, derivative content pieces from that one kind of highest level creative uh, asset. So does that res resonate with what you Yeah, well, heard? and actually, as you talked about the Nickelodeon session, I mean, it's funny because it was at the same time as J.J. Pagano's from Paramount Pictures. Uh, a similar deal because he was talking about, I mean, it was all focused on their YouTube channels. They have many YouTube channels, uh, use of puppets. All, I mean, all those things, actually, there's a lot of similar, we hadn't talked about that. So it's funny to hear that, but you know, I, in doing more with less, I, I kind of went to like efficiency, which, you know, you got to ask, well, what's the outcome? Did the quality go way down? Did they, did they hurt their metrics? Like how good is it? <clears throat> um, and, and one metric that he gave was that between March 2023 and March 2024, they went from 1.6 billion with a B to 2.8 billion watch time minutes. So not only did they get more efficient, but they also saw you know a, a much much higher uh, response rates to the content they were putting out there. But yeah, I did I did hear that routinely in all sorts of ways about doing more with less. Interestingly enough, actually, as I think about it, even in kind of the um, there was a there was a session on sustainability uh, as an environmental sustainability, uh, and and uh, and they also talked about you know intentionally doing more with less as a way of uh, addressing environmental sustainability to some extent. They talked about a lot of things, but uh, that was one aspect of it. So yeah, well let's jump into your second takeaway. What was your second? Well, I think we've just bridged from one okay. to two because the first one was doing more with less. The second one is one of the ways they're doing that is to creating more with less content. But uh, that that theme is just keeps coming in into my mind and um, hearing that over and over. And what you said about um, the performance uh, of the content and kind of scaling and increasing at the same time um, makes me think of another insight from uh, some of the speakers, which was um, that kind of you know, the the kind of master creative content that, that sort of you create all these derivatives from, if that's being created um, using insight um, from measurement, from predictive analytics or from, you know, to performance analytics. To, so you're, you're actually informing the new content creation by what's performing best out there and sort of getting smarter. Um, so it's not just repurposing for repurposing sake. It's actually kind of a work smarter, not harder um, type of theme as well. So were you hearing the same thing in the sessions you were in? Yeah, absolutely. I was looking for the term in my notes that came up in the sustainability uh, session and they, they, I knew there was a specific term they used and it was micro production. So that was just about it. Asking, asking like, do people really need to be here uh, at this production or how can we do production in a way that utilizes this? few people as necessary, only the people required and, and things like that. So, um, and, and they, they did reiterate multiple times that that was not just about environment and sustainability, that there was also a bottom line aspect to that, that was attractive when it came to the financials of, of production and operations. So should we jump to the third? As we hinted earlier, AI was a very big theme. Um, I think every session touched on it. I think at this point, if you're in this type of community, you cannot avoid talking about it because one of the things trends we're obviously seeing with Gen AI is um, creative output or something that looks like it, right? The, the you know, ChatGPT can write, you know, you have uh, Dolly, Midjourney creating, you know, images, video, content, et cetera. And so there's this um, obviously an important concern is, is the AI coming for our jobs as creatives? And um, so that that was sort of touched on by, I think, every speaker that I saw yeah. 
from in some way, shape, or form. It sure was. Um, it was a big theme it, for sure. It, yeah. So you saw the same thing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I I think, and we talked a little bit about this. Uh, there were kind of two competing narratives or counter perspectives. One was, is AI going to take our job? The other one um, was. Uh, boy, isn't it great AI is saving us from having to do all of the mundane um, work that is not creative, is not impactful, but has to be done. So I was interesting. There was that sentiment that what AI and automation, which I, I just want to say quickly, it's kind of a pet peeve of mine, how AI and automation are conflated so much. They're very different things. So let's be clear about that. <laughs> but they are often talked about as being synonymous. So uh, but in this case, I do mean both. Uh, it was talked about. Both of these things were talked about. Um, isn't it great that that can save us so much time um, so that we can now do the most impactful work? I, I would have loved to have heard some more details about that. Like, I love the concept. I don't disagree with that. But I think, you know, where the tension still lies is how exactly will that play out and how true is that? Um I think to alleviate some of the folks that are concerned about is AI going to take our jobs, but I don't know. What do you think? Well, your two kind of views on that, I, I saw um, kind of a through line to them, which was the the answer to the question: Will is AI coming for our jobs? Is no, it's coming for the tedious parts that you never were good at and never got around to in the first place or struggled to do. Which is your point about automation, and there was some conflating there. But I I think what people were saying is use AI to help with automation. Automation isn't just AI driven, obviously. Amen. So um, there are ways to um, insert AI tools to help with certain automation tasks. And so that's that was the theme I was picking up on there. Um, I think a few examples were given of what the practical uses of um, you know those things are. Things like kind of automating delivery of of uh, you know of something once it's once it's created and pushing it out to these various places, um, things like that, just kind of little fiddly bit mm -hmm. stuff. Um, you know, I think um, what um, what Celtra again is doing to um, kind of very rapidly take large volumes of modular assets and then quickly um, repurposing them into you know many, 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 many different assets that can be pushed out to lots of different channels is another example of, uh, I think a there's AI in there, mm -hmm. you know, kind of mixed into that sauce. Um, so so things like that, the kind of um, uh, getting more done faster type of track was coming, that, that was the kind of thing that it was being pushed. Um, but I thought there was one really interesting takeaway. I can't remember who said this now, but they said just you know, be aware that even using AI for automation will still result in more assets, more output, more content. So it's not like just using AI, using AI for automation is is just getting the same stuff done faster. And if we avoid having it do creative, then we'll, we won't mm. increase our output, but but actually we will. So I thought that was a, a really interesting takeaway too. Yeah. There, there are two kind of quotes or moments that come to mind for me. Um, one is I thought that the presentation um, from Dax Alexander was great. That was called The Real Deal, A Practical Roadmap to Harnessing AI in House. So he's from a company called Oliver. And they, um, he, they, they, he talked about a lot of things. He started off by saying the reason we're here is because it's a effing mess, which <laughs> That's a that's a good kind of sobering thought to start with. Uh, and he did that, hit a slide of about a thousand different products that fall into different categories when he said that. So it was, uh, you felt it, you felt it when you looked at it. Uh, but he had a really great framework that they use around um, helping guide folks through the use of AI uh, and, and, you know, all sorts of criteria, uh, what the tools do, how they work what the legal agreements around them in and licensing agreements are around them. Actually, that was the one of the biggest things that came out of it for me is like the legal stuff is the hairiest part probably, right? And so there's a lot of analytical frameworks around use of AI and in large corporate settings in particular um, where uh, there's a 
lot of uh, probably you know nail biting going on about like are people using a dark AI uh, that's not been yet vetted and and uh, approved by the company. But the other thing that was relative to that was uh, Guido Dirks, I believe was his name, um, <laughs> talked about. I mean, he kind of started his talk by saying um, he 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 was sitting around with friends and and had the the realization. You know, we were just talking about the AI taking away all of the all of the mundane tasks that him he had the realization, wait, are we the robots, right? We're doing all of the mundane tasks, all of this really boring, systematic, non creative work. Um, so I thought that was an interesting and funny twist. Yeah. I think I so well, Dax's presentation kind of was the lead the jumping off point for my fourth takeaway, which his message, another one of his messages was AI is here to stay, embrace it, you know, wrestle with it mm-hmm. because you're going to need to figure this out. So I thought his um, framework that you mentioned, he, here's a very practical kind of four step process to adoption. Um, and he really emphasized the culture shift. There's there's resistance. There's certain people who are, you know, embracing it, running, let's go, let's do this, uh, maybe recklessly, perhaps. Yeah. So he's also got a lot of caution, I think, in his approach. Um, and then there's a lot of people, maybe the majority, who are very apprehensive, nervous, they don't understand it, and, and you know, ob- and rightfully scared and confused. So, um, you know, he, he did talk a lot about the culture piece being, you know, the number one driver and that you have to kind of bring people along in really interesting and uh, ways that having um, tying whatever you're trying to do with it to strategy being a really key piece and then having leadership sponsorship um, was also a big part of that. And then he his framework was sort of a, uh, I think it was, you know, define what are the goals we're trying to achieve here. Um, I select the, the right tools based on your use cases, really get into what those are, pilot, and then scale. And he had a lot of really interesting anecdotal stories to share about how they do scale if they decide through a pilot like okay let's adopt the tool how they scale it out to their like 5,000 I believe employees yeah. um, so that was really interesting to hear yeah. about as a side note that just made me think of the change management conversation I'll just in, I'll just inject a couple of thoughts here so there was a there was a session called mastering change management there's a few great things one is uh, there was a woman uh, who worked for um, Office of General Services, Media Services in New York, Kate Schmied, Schmieding, rhymes with meeting. I remember that's how she introduced herself. Um, and she she had a meeting. She has a meeting with her staff once a week called I Hate It Here, which is in which all the staff members come and they talk about the things they hate, which I thought, uh, and, and someone asked, how do you make that productive? And she said, it's not, that's not what it's about. It's about people being able to vent and talk about the things that annoy them and, and things like that. So I thought that was just, that that got the room cracking up. That was hilarious. And she was, uh, she was, uh, I, I, I appreciated that contribution. Um, but the other thing that came out of that change management meeting was, or change management session was, I love it, someone, you know, some kind of one of the concluding thoughts, it was also one of the opening thoughts is, they try to remind their employees that change is not permanent. It's not forever. And I thought that's, that's an, what an oxymoron, right? <laughs> But yeah, <laughs> I like it. I, in Dax's Dax's session, that definitely came to light. Is is uh, how do you roll that out through a large organization? Yeah, and it sounded like this is not a similar thing, but they do have sort of a recurring meeting, uh, but like an office hours type of thing where they, you know, people can come, and uh, it's it's somebody that's new to the technology that's actually running the session and trying to teach it to colleagues and they're, you know, struggling with that as well. So it's like, you know, they're, they're, they're barely half a step ahead of the other people coming. So they're kind of helping people learn together. Um, but they've got the SMEs sort of lurking in the wings in case they need to jump in. But that, that was kind of cool. Um, just to kind of help, yeah. you know, they're helping each other along through that process. Yeah, that but, is cool. Um, that's a great idea. Uh, it's a good structure. Yeah. I like that. I hate it here. Meaning, to <laughs> that's, 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 a, that's I mean, that's a totally that's different. A meeting. Courageous exercise as the leader of an organization to to engage in. I give her props for that. Um, yeah. 
So the other person who had a framework, and it's related to your point number five, or your takeaway number five, was Tony Gill. He also showed a framework that was, I mean, we couldn't see the details of these, but on its face, it kind of looked similar to what Dak showed in the sense that it had kind of red, green, yellow areas of risk and things like that. But what what is your fifth point? Well, my fifth point was uh, kind of a message for DAM professionals, for digital asset management uh, practitioners, um, because this group of folks are, are are the ones that are the creative operations people are kind of orchestrating the creation and reuse of the assets that a digital asset management person is um, is stewarding. Um. Um, and a lot of the the use cases of the creative teams are not necessarily met by enterprise dams. So to- Tony sort of broke that out and said, um, you know, in an inter- enterprise dam solution, um, which he he also kind of lumped with a marketing dam, which is a lot of times where it sits. Um, you know, it's very much more of a library kind of solution. It's search, browse, download, share, use, um, disseminate, measure, but, um, you know, with rights and security mixed in. The needs of the creative groups are a lot more, you know, we need speed, we need edit, we need file lock, we need version control, collaboration. And these are all features that are in, di- you know, all of the features combined are in digital asset management solutions, but, you um, they're not always done well for the creative production groups. And within an organization, there's usually, not usually, but often one dam and it's the enterprise solution. And so we've seen that with our clients that there's the creative groups are sort of still left out in the cold, like fending with themselves on hard drives and whatnot. And, you know, it's not well integrated into their workflows. So I think his point was there's been a fraught relationship there And, you know, the dam community should be looking at this closely to think, how can we kind of enable this creative reuse um, but by meeting the the folks where they are? Um, So, yeah, that was that was one of my key takeaways from Tony's talk that I thought was very interesting. One of the questions he raised uh, and apparently at Dam New York 2023, he won a pair of headphones in the stump of the consultant session for asking the best question um, was, should work in process assets be stored in the dam? Apparently still a hot topic because lots of people had lots (laughs) of thoughts about that. And he did a hand raise in the room about who thinks they should, who thinks they shouldn't. And uh, who's in between. Um, but what, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I thought that was funny because I've been on the Stump the Consultant panel one mm-hmm. time at DMLA. Mm-hmm. I was not at the one that he won the thing for on the panel, but I was in the audience. Oh, okay. And I remember thinking, what would my answer to this question uh-huh. be? <laughs> and, I w- and he had said that the, the, the panel all either gave the response of yes or it depends. And I was, I was like, yep, I would have been one of those it depends people. Um, and you know, because I think it depends <laughs> on the, you know, the 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 purpose of the dam system, who it's serving, you know, what are the main use cases that it's, you know, helping to enable. And if your main use cases are, um, you know, spread out and and varied enough that, um, you know, that there it warrants more of that library like approach and and library system, then that may be your right solution. Maybe you don't have creative. Um, uh, production in house, maybe that's at, at agency partners. So therefore, that's not necessarily a need. Um, but uh, if you do have, especially video production in house, um, you know, there is often a need for a two system solution. Yeah. And I think he was also pointing to that, like embrace this. This is, you know, there's a photo studio or a video production. PAM or MAM, so production asset management or media asset management system that's more going to have those features that he was describing, you know, faster edit, version control, you know, file lock, collaboration, et cetera, to service them through that edit process and then push to the final final deliverables and kind of evergreen content right. yep. to the, the enterprise dam. Um, I think he was advocating for that kind of model. And I thought that was a really good point. And I've seen that work well in a lot of cases. And therefore, you have a home for the work in progress when it's it's in that kind of PAM environment. Yeah, that's, that's exactly where my head went with, which is over the years in our work, I think here about organizations like HBO, for instance, like 
they have a PAM and there is a new, I've heard PAM more recently in reference to what someone referred to as a product asset management in addition to a PIM product. <clears throat> but um, PAM as in production asset management, this is an asset management system used for uh, production and post-production processes for things that are work in process and the final state deliverables that come out of that is what goes into a dam that is used for distribution and access and things like that. So, it, and I and I sat with a group of folks at lunch and, and I kind of posed that question because the, everybody had been in Tony's session so, and, and no one else there had heard of a production asset management system before. Um, <laughs> which I think, you know, it, it may have to do more with just uh, folks that are more involved in kind of media and entertainment workflows where video production has driven that need. It was so much more necessary to have a PAM that was separate from the dam when you're dealing with kind of really large file sizes and maybe more complex operations than compared to non-video workflows. I don't know. I wasn't quite sure why why I was the only one at that table that had, had had that experience. But do you have any thoughts on that? Well, I do think it's from, those who are familiar with it are either going to be from, yeah, media and entertainment, production, bigger production companies, um, or large enterprises that have had in-house video production. And I do think this is rooted in the video space. Um, this, this, but I, I, Tony was also talking about photo studio. Mm-hmm. Um, it's true. Uh, kind of, T- PAM-like system. So th- that's interesting as well. Um, but yeah, we've done work with clients in the past where we helped with PAM implementation. Then there was a DAM. Uh, I mean, sometimes they call it MAM. The PAM-MAM thing gets, I think, confusing. There's mm-hmm. there's a little bit of a identity crisis yeah. between those things. But um, so some people might be like, what's a PAM? I've heard of MAM. Right. So, you know, I think there's, there's some acronym um, overload going on, but um, it is still larger organizations or, or very media heavy yeah. organizations. And because and, um, what I also thought was interesting related to this was I was in the session of producers, uh, a, a panel of producers, and I asked the question, okay, you're talking about a lot of content reuse, repurposing, using archival, using library content. So what can digital asset managers do to better support you and they were like, we don't know what you're talking about. What's that? <laughs> you know, it was basically their response. What's that as in, <laughs> I was like, as in what? What's that in that sense? What's digital asset management? Oh, really? wow. Like these, a lot of these are from small production okay. companies, independent filmmakers. Um, and they're just like, I'm over here trying to deal with the files. And if you can help, can you teach me something? I'd like to ask you a few questions. So it kind of made me realize like those who even know this concept are they're, they're in a privileged position to begin right. with because you're in a big company that has supported this technology and infrastructure and people um, that that can can enable that. But it's a, a lot very of people point. out there are just winging it on their own. They're working in file sharing systems, hard drives, small raids. You know, they're just trying to keep the files organized. But DAM as a practice is, is not present in many, many, many places. Right. So um, that was also... Uh, an aha moment like oh yeah this right. does not exist everywhere right well dam operations exist in all of those scenarios but whether they're recognized sure. as dam operations and how well they're serving their users is another question any other final takeaways before we sign off here um no i think it was a great event i enjoyed it a lot um and i'd i'd love to go back i think it was um some very good conversations um you know, it was, it was extremely active. The participation was, um, you know, kind of, it, it was, everyone was very engaged. Yeah. Um, so I thought that was wonderful. Yeah, I agree. I, was, I think Henry Stewart did a great job putting it together. I think that the uh, all four consultants, consultants, I think all four moderators, uh, some of which were consultants, uh, did a great job. And, and we got, you know, while I said that I sat in Thomas's uh, creative operations stream all day, there was a final session at the end of the day, which I think was fantastic. I think Henry Stewart should do this anytime there's multiple panels. They brought all four facilitators, moderators of those streams uh, together to kind of summarize, recap, engage with the audience. And uh, so we got to hear about and see 
um, from all of them. And I thought they were all just fantastic. They did a really wonderful job. And that was a really fun session. I thought that was a great way to end it. So a uh, big shout out yeah. and props to everybody involved in that decision and then actually making it happen. Yeah, I think, yeah, the Henry Stewart team deserves a round of applause. All of the moderators, obviously all the speakers. Um, but uh, yeah, I second that. The end of the day session where they brought the moderators together. And um, I, I think the audience was just so engaged at that point. There were so many questions. The conversation kept flowing. I think we went right past the time where the drinks were supposed <laughs> to start. And people were fine right. with that. They were just like, let's keep talking. So it's a good I think sign. that was wonderful. That's a good sign. It yeah. is. Great. All right. Well, thanks so much for joining me today. Thanks so much for the great um, takeaways. And uh, as I said, that's a LinkedIn post that folks can go check out too. And yeah, it was fun. Thanks, Kara. It was fun. Yeah. Thank you.